All right, um, so let's get started here. W welcome everybody, both online and uh, in life. Um, we're here to talk about the gun versus Minton argument, which we heard this morning. Um, uh, before we start, I want to make a, a, a quick plug for some future PIDGIP um, argument recaps we're having coming up uh, this semester. Um, so February 19th, we'll have the Bowman versus Monsanto argument, uh, which addresses uh, patent exhaustion. Um, on March 21st, 2013, we're having a slightly different uh, um, recap of the Kurtzsang versus Wiley argument, which already occurred, uh, but that'll be a recap and an implication of, of the decision, hopefully. Uh, March 25th, we'll be doing FTC versus Watson, which deals with um, reverse payments and um, antitrust issues. Um, and with no date set, we will uh, be doing the Myriad case, uh, Association for Molecular Pathology versus Myriad Genetics, um, which, as many people know, deals with some uh, major patent 101 issues. Um, today, we're talking about a case that um, deals with uh, two things that maybe don't come up a lot in cocktail conversation, patent law and federal jurisdiction, uh, but something I think that uh, hardcore attorneys really get into. So I hope we can have uh, some great discussion today. I'll do a quick recap um, of sort of the issues we're dealing with, sort of set the, uh, the legal issues at, uh, at stake, and then I'll have some of our panelists um, talk about what happened today and maybe the implications of what's going on. So let me quickly introduce um, everyone on the panel. On the far left, um, we have Jane Weber, who is an attorney at Scott Douglas uh, McConico in Austin, Texas. Um, she argued for petitioner this morning. Um, so she's coming sort of off the high of arguing from the justices. Um, next to her uh, is Greg Carr, who's with uh, Carr IP, also in Texas, I believe. Um, um, he's with the respondent. Um, next to him um, uh, is Mr. Shields. I actually didn't write down your first name. Theodore, Theodore Shields. Shields, who's with the Shields Law Firm, also uh, with respondent. And to my immediate left is Rory Ryan, who's a professor at Baylor Law School. Um, who uh, was an amicus in this case and uh, sort of aligns with the petitioner's argument, but he can get into the details of that um, a little later. So, um, so what are we talking about today? We're talking about uh, jurisdiction, essentially. We're talking about what arising under means, uh, particularly in 28 U.S.C. 1338. Uh, so this is a, a term that the Supreme Court has grappled with for a century um, without great resolution. And it comes up in this case in, in the patent law context. Um, Federal courts have jurisdiction over any case that arises under the patent laws. Um, so the exact contours of that are, are what we'll discuss today. And, and we're dealing with a malpractice case, which the details of which we'll discuss later. Um, so the case law we need to know about is essentially a 2005 case, uh, the Supreme Court, Grable, um, which stated that uh, arising under has um, a number of requirements. Um, you have to show that the right to relief necessarily depends on a resolution of a substantial question of federal law, and that is disputed, and that jurisdiction will not disturb the balance of state and federal interests. So that's the case we're all trying to interpret, that the Supreme Court's going to have to interpret now. Um, the, the Federal Circuit, which is the court that deals with patent cases, in 2007 issued two opinions, uh, which essentially gave it very broad jurisdiction over um, any case that has a patent element. So they interpreted Grable very broadly. So that, those cases are also at issue um, in the case today. So um, with that intro, um, I'll turn the time over to uh, Ms. Weber, who can talk about um, your side of the case, maybe the facts involved in this particular case, and then we'll come back to you later about um, how the argument went today. Okay. The, um, the lawsuit, the case that was before the Supreme Court today, is a legal malpractice lawsuit, but it arises out of an underlying patent infringement lawsuit. So you have to back up to the earlier lawsuit before you can arrive at what we were arguing about today, the jurisdictional issue we were arguing about today. In the underlying lawsuit, there was a dispute, a lawsuit brought by an inventor named Minton against the NASDAQ, contending that the NASDAQ was infringing on Mr. Minton's patent for an invention that allowed for online trading of securities. So Minton hired some lawyers, who I'm going to call the lawyer defendants. He hired the lawyer defendants to represent him in the infringement lawsuit against the NASDAQ. It was in federal court in the Eastern District of Texas, and ultimately it was um, dismissed on summary judgment against Mr. Minton, and the federal district court in the Eastern District of Texas 
declared that Mr. Minton's patent was invalid based on a, um, a statutory doctrine called the on-sale bar. And what that is basically is that if your patent, if you have an invention that's ready for patenting and you offer it for commercial use, you sell it or you lease it, more than one year before you apply for the patent, then your patent's no good. So the NASDAQ won a summary judgment that Mr. Mitten's patent was no good because of the on-sale bar, that it had been the subject of a commercial lease for more than a year before. And that was a final judgment in the federal district court, and then it was uh, appealed to the federal circuit, and that was affirmed. Then Mr. Mitten sued his lawyers from the lawyer defendants, the folks who'd represented him in the patent litigation. He sued them saying, I only lost that on-sale bar summary judgment because you, the lawyers, were negligent in that you did not timely raise a defense to the on-sale bar, the experimental use doctrine, which says that if the commercial lease, the, the, the commercial use of the, um, of the invention in the year prior, if that use was primarily for experimental purposes, then the clock a ticking for a year doesn't count against me and I wouldn't have lost on summary judgment. My patent would not have been invalidated. I would have won that lawsuit. And so I'm suing you now, the lawyer, de lawyer defendants. So in a, he sued, brought the lawsuit against the lawyer defendants in state district court in Texas, sensibly, because that is a state claim, professional negligence, straight up negligence. Uh, so he brought that suit, filed it in state district court in Tarrant County, Texas, which is Fort Worth, and uh, alleged that the lawyers were negligent and that proximately caused damages to him. Now, as part of the legal malpractice lawsuit, and this is, in our opinion, this is the, one of the significant concepts in the, the interplay of patent issues and jurisdiction in this case, is the concept of a case within a case. In any legal malpractice lawsuit, you have to, the plaintiff, the former client, has to establish not just any black letter law of negligence, duty, breach of duty, proximate cause damages. But in a legal malpractice concept, the breach of duty is the, you know, did you fail to raise experimental use timely? That's the breach of duty question. But then the causation question is the case within a case. Would it have made a difference? Would you have won or lost your underlying patent lawsuit against the NASDAQ but for what the lawyers did? And so that's where the horse is buried in the, uh, in the legal malpractice case. And in this instance, because the underlying case was a patent issue, the case within a case was involved in the issue of patent law. Did, would Mr. Mitten have won his patent infringement lawsuit against the NASDAQ or at a minimum have dodged the bullet on the summary judgment on the on-sale bar but for the alleged negligence of failure to raise experimental use timely. Well, the defendant lawyers in the legal malpractice lawsuit in state court filed a motion for summary judgment claiming um, that as a matter of law, on the summary judgment standard, Mr. Mitten would have lost anyway, because in fact, the experimental use exception didn't give him any relief from the on-sale bar because his, the, the, the commercial lease at issue didn't qualify. Um, so there was a summary judgment proceeding. There was, uh, it was a fairly focused, it was early on in the litigation. Um, the parties agreed to tee up this issue. There was limited discovery on this one question, and the state district court granted the summary judgment motion on that one element, um, that as a matter of law, there was no evidence that the commercial lease was in fact primarily for experimental use. And so there was a final judgment there. Mr. Mitten appeals it to the Texas State Intermediate Court of Appeals, the Fort Worth Court of Appeals, the second district of Texas. And the, at that point, while it's pending on appeal at the Fort Worth Court of Appeals, the Federal Circuit decides a pair of cases uh, in 2007, a pair of cases on the same day by the same panel, one called air measurement, one called immunocept, where the court declared it, announced that it was deciding as a matter of first impression 
that legal malpractice cases arising out of underlying patent matters come within the exclusive jurisdiction of the federal courts under 28 U.S.C. 1338A because of this case within a case business, because the the legal malpractice court's going to have to decide would you have won or lost your legal malpractice case as part of the state professional negligence matter, and so that embedded question comes within 1338A, exclusive jurisdiction. So then at that point, the four, we're pending at the, court of, the state court of appeals, where we've all been happy as clams. And um, so the court asked for briefing on it. We all filed supplemental briefing on the jurisdiction issue. And I, I represent the defendant lawyers. And our pitch to the Fort Worth Court of Appeals was that on this jurisdiction question of whether there's exclusive federal court jurisdiction, yes, yes, the federal circuit said it came within 1338A, but they got it wrong. The federal circuit misapplied the U.S. Supreme Court's prior decision in the Grable case, misapplied the prongs of Grable on a substantiality and federalism component, and so you, the, the state court of appeals, should say no thank you to the federal circuit's jurisdictional land grab. You should say that Texas state courts are perfectly capable of resolving this one, and then you should take up the merits of the summary judgment. And that's exactly what the Fort Worth Court of Appeals did. They analyzed jurisdiction. They said no thank you to the federal circuit rule. Then they went on and they affirmed the summary judgment on the merits. Then Mr. Minton appealed it to the Supreme Court of Texas, and we, we all briefed it on both sides fully on the jurisdiction issue and on the merits, and the Supreme Court of Texas split five to three. One justice did not sit, but they split five to three with the majority following the Federal Circuit's construct and saying that these claims belong within the exclusive jurisdiction of the Federal Courts under 28 U.S.C. 1338A following the Federal Circuit construct. So then at that point, we, the lawyer defendants, filed a cert petition to the Supreme Court of the United States saying that not just that the Texas Supreme Court got it wrong, but that what the Texas Supreme Court got wrong was that they were following the Federal Circuit having gone awry on the jurisdictional standard. And look, here are all these courts everywhere who are following this, following the lemmings going off the cliff, and you need to rein this one back in. So in early October, the court there have been a number of cases. I want to say our case was about the fourth or fifth or sixth cert petition to come up on this issue since the Federal Circuit decided that pair of cases in 07. And uh, there was enough of a white noise in the lower courts, the state courts and the federal courts, that the uh, U.S. Supreme Court took our case. They took ours and they held two others that present the same issue. I think they took ours because it cleanly presents. The, the jurisdictional issue without any other eerie guesses or this or that. And today we had argument on it, uh, on the precise qu question of, well, I guess it's narrowly, does Mr. Minton's legal malpractice claim come within 1338 jurisdiction? But more broadly, how do you analyze 1338A jurisdiction uh, over state law legal malpractice claims? Great. Thanks. Um, so, so what we have is a, a jurisdictional question of what arising under me means. Does a legal malpractice claim, which is a state law claim, arise under the patent laws when there's a necessary or an element of that malpractice claim that involves the patent laws? Um, so that's what the court has to decide here. So um, I want to turn uh, to Mr. Carr um, and, and ask a little bit, um, at the end of what Ms. Weber was saying, she, she sort of talked about the implications of this, right? We're talking about should we be in state or federal court? That's, that's the distinction. For some of our students, I find when I try and teach this, that they say, well, who cares? Just choose one or the other. So help us understand what are the implications of this? Why, why, right, right. Why, why, why do we care about this? Why does one group or another want to be in state or federal court or, or yeah. I'll just give you a very brief answer, and then I'm going to pass the question to Ted Shields, Great. who did more work on the briefing uh, for the Supreme Court. But it's basically that the federal system was set up in 1982 with the installation of the federal circuit to bring uniformity to patent law. And so we have appeals from district courts in patent cases going to the federal circuit. 
If the Supreme Court in this case chooses to reverse the uh, Texas Supreme Court and allow each state's set of courts to also address these patent malpractice cases, because they are cases within a case, you're now going to have 50 states making their own decisions again. I guess it, bef before the Federal Circuit it was uh, 11 circuits. Um, making decisions again that could impact the behavior of counsel and, and could conflict with uh, the federal courts. But Ted's going to talk more about that. Uh, I hope I'm pushing the button. All right. Um, what, what counsel for the, uh, the lawyer defendants had, had said is that all the courts are following the federal just simply following the federal circuit, um, that actually didn't happen in our case. The, uh, the Texas State Supreme Court did an independent analysis uh, of Grable. And it, it, getting back uh, to the jurisdiction question a little bit, or backing up, it would be very easy to simply say, well, what is the state, what is the law that this arises? That is, what, what law creates the right of action? Malpractice. Malpractice is what? It's a state law um, created uh, a legal remedy or legal right. So then it would be simple. But the Supreme Court has long ago abandoned that uh, simplistic approach in favor of a Grable analysis. And the Grable analysis has uh, four factors that were applied in this case independently by the, st the Texas State Supreme Court. And the Grable analysis is how one determines whether or not a federal question is embedded in an otherwise state law claim. And that's the analysis that uh, was applied. Now, in the, uh, as Mr. Carr says, we start here in this case with the creation of the federal circuit. Now, the, the federal circuit, uh, the reason it was created was to bring uniformity to patent law. And it is unique among other areas of federal law and state law in that there is only one uh, nationwide patent court of nationwide court of appeals that all patent cases go to uh, for one single one single court that sits and decides those. And that is a unique concept to patent law and was specifically instituted for that reason. One of the factors in uh, Grable is the substantiality of the federal interest. And in analyzing the Grable analysis for the, uh, the substantiality of the federal claim, that is one of the arguments that, that came to bear, that in this case, we are dealing with the, the case within a case is the case. There was never really any uh, substantial claim that the lawyer defendants did not raise this uh, experimental use defense timely. The federal circuit in the appeal of the underlying case pointed that out. And that is the sole issue on appeal. Every case that was cited in the analysis by the uh, lower court and by the, uh, the Court of Appeals, were, they were Federal Circuit patent cases. So it was essentially retrying the patent case. So, that, so what we were dealing with is a question of should we be presenting how a patent case was conducted that decided where the patent rights do or don't go. And we're going to decide the question of the lawyer's conduct in that case using the exact same analysis that a federal court would have to uh, present. And then that analysis going to the federal circuit. And instead of having the same court system that decides the underlying matter in the first place, the federal court system with a single court of appeals, and instead of having that court of appeals handle what the mess that was created under their watch, that then that's going to go to a completely separate system of state court judges that are um, elected uh, by a local popular vote and may handle all kinds of cases from divorces to um, to uh, slip and fall, but never patents. There, there were a couple of examples, maybe, Ted, you can give about uh, uh, the state court's opinion uh, as to the application of the experimental use that differs 
or, or answer some questions that are, have not yet been answered by the Federal Circuit? Um, I hope I can answer that question. Uh, the, some of the, uh, the, the, there were disputes on the law. That is, one, one could expect that a, that a state court judge that has never dealt with a patent case and probably never will uh, would not get things right. And in this case, uh, he didn't. He, he, um, uh, the, the parties, the parties argued about whether the experimental use exception was a question of law or a question of fact. The Supreme Court has weighed in on that as being a question of, of fact. The uh, the Federal Circuit has said it's a question of fact. The judge in this case said it was a question of law. There were um, there were there were other uh, distinctions between the the underlying decision and what a Federal Circuit analysis would have been. Uh, but the, the essence of that, let's say that um, the dichotomy there is that even though this case, uh, even though this case starts out as a uh, state malpractice case, the controlling law the controlling facts applied to the controlling law are all 100 percent patent matters. And patent matters go to, uh, are exclusively federal and have one single court of appeals. And that's um, when one takes that into consideration and that we have patent practitioners all over the country that are being guided by a single court of appeals. Uh, the argument for the respondents has been that this belongs, that this is properly raises a substantial issue of federal law that's actually disputed, that it is uh, controlling of the outcome, and that it does not upset federal state balance because the, uh, the state court simply never deals with these kinds of questions, and the uniformity that is required of patent law decisions uh, demands a federal forum. So that was the petitioner's argument, basically. I'm, see, I'm sorry, the respondent's argument. Great. Okay, so we have the arguments out there. Before we get into today's um, impressions of the argument today, uh, let me turn the time over to Professor Ryan. Um, so petitioner, in essence, I'm going to uh, sort of parrot your argument, says all of these cases should end up in state court. Um, uh, respondent says the opposite. All of these cases, or, or most of these cases, should end up in federal court. Right. So Professor Ryan has a slightly mm -hmm. different take, as any good academic should on um, how that question should come out. So let me give him a couple of minutes to, to discuss that. I'm sure I have listened to two hours worth of argument today about the proper application of the Grable standard. I've read briefing in this case and spent probably 40 hours with my federal court students. I've been teaching Grable since 2005. I've written three articles about Grable and I have no idea who's right. <laughs> I have no idea what Grable needs. It manipulates levels of generality. It is nothing more than a vague, fuzzy standard that allows a court post hoc to determine, yeah, this is the kind of issue we want back in federal court. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, I made one last pitch in this case for people to listen to him. He was no simpleton, right? Justice Holmes was no simpleton. And he recognized early on, construing the arising under statutes, that we're going to draw a bright line. A suit arises under the law that creates the cause of action. We teach our first year civil procedure students no whining. You come into court, you say, what bad happened to me? What legal standard can you prove that makes that actionable? What sovereign created it? Here, state malpractice, state court, period, end of discussion. That was Justice Holmes. He commanded a majority, but the Supreme Court soon yielded to temptation because they just couldn't be told in Smith versus Kansas City title that they couldn't decide the facial constitutionality of a federal statute that was embedded in a shareholder's derivative claim. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, Justice Holmes, I know it was just a few years ago, but you're going to have to go back and dissent um, because we're going to exercise jurisdiction and not really tell anybody why. It was this departure and the Supreme Court's identification of a need to hear certain cases created by state law that were substantial and important enough that has given rise to the disaster that is what I call the second branch of jurisdiction. First branch, if federal law creates the cause of action, 
there's jurisdiction. Second branch, state law creates the cause of action. There's an embedded federal issue. Here's what's been written about what is the type of issue that satisfies the second branch. How do I, we identify them? Well, it has to be substantial. And the court says, let me help you define substantial. That means important. Well, I don't know any more than I did before. And so it has to, how do we determine it? It takes a common sense accommodation to kaleidoscopic situations. Got it? This is not okay for a jurisdictional inquiry. A jurisdictional inquiry that is vague and amorphous creates too much litigation about where to litigate. And the consequences of a bright line rule are not grave. The consequences of, let's say over the last 80 years, there have been 20 cases that were state created that really should have been in federal court. I challenge you to go on Westlaw and find, find more than that unless you agree with respondents in this case with the malpractice you may. What are the consequences? It's not like tort law where you draw bright lines, where somebody has to pay when they shouldn't, or where somebody doesn't recover and they should. It's that you've got a federal issue and you have to go to state court in a tribunal that is bound by the supremacy clause and due process, subject to certiorari review in the United States Supreme Court. All right, so there are a few cases that fit that. There's no question. Bright line rules have consequences. But everybody wants to focus on, well, why can't a federal court hear this particular case? And the reason is because it ignores what this test does to all the rest of the cases. Grable doesn't just impact the cases that get into federal court. It is so fuzzy, so vague and amorphous that it creates a non-sanctionable opportunity for delay and removal in any case that comes within it. And so it's tried. And almost 90%, I think 87% of a published study uh, concluded that cases were removed, delayed a little more than six months, and then remanded. At one point, out of 67 cases that reached the appellate court, 44 were remanded after appeal and sent back to state court because nobody knows what it means. And the focus on, well, gee, and Smith, we, we really should have heard this case, is just misplaced. It should be a systemic focus that accounts for the entire category of cases, particularly at removal and remand. And we get so many benefits in so many cases from not causing litigation about where to litigate that we should say, yeah, over 80 years, there are a few cases that should have been decided in one tribunal over the other. But that harm, and it is a harm, is nothing compared to the harm created by the fuzzy jurisdictional test. I do not have five votes for this. <laughs> well, you probably, you probably have one, right? Scalia, Scalia said today that he, that he liked it. Well, we've got Justice Thomas. OK. Justice he, Scalia, he didn't say that. Justice Scalia read. You can tell from his question. <laughs> Justice Scalia read and quoted from the brief. That's two. All right, two. I'm three short. <laughs> so let me go back to Ms. Weber. Um, speaking of oral argument, as an advocate, what su was there anything that surprised you today about uh, the questions, the demeanor, uh, how the court was? Um, I, I know you prepare forever for these things, but there's always something that maybe takes you off guard or you weren't expecting. Is there anything today that you thought they focused on that you wouldn't have anticipated or any questions that, that caught you off guard? Um, there weren't any questions that caught me off guard because, because we, uh, I'm sure I'm certain on both sides, you know, we prepared, we thought about questions. Uh, Professor Ryan helped, um, uh, participated in a MOOC, helped organize, you know, one of the MOOC courts to help me prepare. So I feel as though all of the questions we saw coming, the, the thing that I didn't see coming was the um, chunk of time when I had no questions. I went, um, one of my brothers very scientifically looked at his watch and he uh, told me I had about seven minutes where I had no questions and it was just hamada, 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 I did that, uh, which, which I didn't see that coming. But, you know, that's always a treat to, to, to get to tap dance. I think that the, the court, um, the court under, obviously they understand the issues. Um, I think that they, they did, in questions on both sides, they did focus on one of the one of the unique aspects of this jurisdictional um, issue, and that is the hypothetical aspect 
of a legal malpractice case. And when I use the term hypothetical, what I mean is that the case within a case bit, it's not really a patent case. It's not, in fact, a patent infringement action. It's a pretend one. It's a hypothetical one. It's not, did NASDAQ infringe with the consequences from that judgment that you'd have had in the underlying infringement patent matter. It's, if the lawyer had done something different, then it would it have been different. But at the end of the day, even if Mr. Mitten won a legal malpractice judgment, what he would have is a judgment for dollars against the lawyer defendants. He would not have his patent back. There is nothing that could happen in a, in a legal malpractice action, whether in state court or federal court, that would undo the final irrevocable, no longer appealable, absolutely done result that already happened before in the patent litigation. And that hypothetical, it is our position, undercuts the substantiality of the federal issue to such an extent that you can't get there. And, and the, the hypothetical nature actually is most stark if you talk about a legal malpractice action arising from a um, patent, like a, a proceeding to apply for a patent and receive a patent from the PTO as opposed to, say, a, a, a lawsuit. If a uh, legal malpractice arises out from a, a um, you know, patent action before the, the Patent and Trademark Office, let's say, okay, inventor hires lawyers to represent them before the PTO. The PTO, for whatever reason, says, ixnay, not going to give you a patent, sorry, you don't have one. Don't have a patent. It's done. Inventor sues the lawyer saying, it was your negligence. You filed too late or you didn't do it right or you, you described the claim, whatever it was, the negligence, whatever the, the errors were. And if you'd done those things right, I'd have gotten my patent. And the inventor wins. And the malpractice court says, yes, inventor would have won and therefore it proximately caused damages. Here's a judgment for so many dollars. Well. That didn't give the inventor the patent from the PTO. That, that decision, that ship has sailed. And no matter what happens in this subsequent malpractice action, you do not have any resolution of actual patent rights. And the, 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 it, it's wholly hypothetical. The consequences do not implicate any actual patent rights. And, and in an oddball way, even if you put all these lawsuits in federal court, every legal malpractice case arising out of a patent matter, even if you put them all in federal court, you would still have a tribunal deciding a legal malpractice case with an embedded question over which that tribunal would not have had subject matter jurisdiction in the first instance because a federal district court has no subject matter jurisdiction to grant or deny a patent in the first instance. Only the PTO does. So you, just as the state court can decide a case within a case where the underlying case within a case can only be in federal court, federal district court can decide a case within a case where the underlying one can only have been before the PTO. And that's not unique to patents in any way. Legal malpractice cases arise out of all kinds of tribunals. You might sue someone saying, you screwed up my appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States. And so the district court's going to have to decide how would the nine justices have decided this case but for the error of the appellate lawyer or the probate judge in dividing the estate or the administrative, uh, the state administrative body that granted or didn't grant my drilling permit uh, to drill a gas well in West Texas. All of those matters have subject matter that is not within the subject matter jurisdiction of a plain vanilla trial court, and we can try those case within a case hypothetical resolutions in a, in a state court without doing any damage to any actual patent rights. Great. Any, any other impressions from um, right. today? Can Things I make that, a comment? Yeah. Um, the, the, let me address first 
the issue, which I thought was kind of surprising, that uh, Justice Sotomayor seemed to, to uh, like, which is that we're really not dealing with any patent rights here because of this, the hypothetical nature of the case, the hypothetical nature being the patent's already been uh, uh, obliterated by the malpractice. So this new case, which after all is supposed to benefit the patent owner, really doesn't have anything to do with the patent. Well, if we stop and think about it, the value of the patent is what? The value of the patent is the incentive it gives to inventors to actually invent and patent their inventions. So the focus on the patent, I think, is a little bit misplaced. I think the focus ought to be on the rights, including the remedies that the inventor has uh, for the damage done by losing his patent. And that gets right back to what the inventor would have gotten had he, he or she been able to enforce its patent. So if you look at it that way, you're still dealing with the same case that you would have been in federal court. Ideally, this plaintiff is going to get the same recovery that it would have gotten had it not had the malpractice committed in the original federal court patent infringement action in order to come as close as possible to give that pat former patent owner the relief, that same federal court ought to be deciding the case. That's one way to look at it. It's not a small thing. You know, patents are, are created by Congress. Congress was given that authority by the Constitution under Article I, Section 8. This is the same article that allows Congress to raise an army and raise a navy. If they'd had enough foresight, they would have, would have also been able to raise an Air Force, but it just wasn't possible at the time. Okay, so that's one, that's one if point. If I may add one thing, I like to point this out sometimes, that Article I, Section 8 predates the Bill of Rights. This was, a, this was big time important to the founders. Right. And, you know, we can, we can look at Thomas Jefferson, who was the first commissioner of patents, and he actually invented the most efficient plow that had ever been used at the time. He chose not to patent it because he thought it, it was unbecoming and too much of a conflict of interest for somebody in his position to be trying to get a patent. Um, think about it. Horsepower at the time really meant horsepower. And this, and this, uh, uh, plow actually reduced the number of horses you had had to use to draw it. Benjamin Franklin, who's also you know heavily involved in, in everything going on at the time, was an avid inventor. He invented uh, bifocals, which seemed like nothing. Uh, he he uh, discovered the relationship between uh, lightning and static electricity and that sort of thing. Okay, so I'll get off that soapbox. The the second issue is that. Uh, I think everybody admits in this case that if the state court makes a decision about patent law, the federal courts don't have to follow it, and vice versa. So that means that we have set up a stage where there can indeed be two different systems going in parallel, which, which only coincide and become more uniform if, if the Supreme Court decides to take up the case. That was a point made by uh, Justice Ginsburg today. She asked the question, what's the problem? Wouldn't we be able to, to resolve this once the state case got up to the Supreme Court? Well, that's true, but, but look at all of the time it takes to get to the Supreme Court and look at all of the, all of the wackiness that could happen by having two, two different systems. And let me give you a specific example of how that happened in this case. Let's just assume that that this state court judge, the trial judge, decided he wanted to find for the defendants in this case. Sometimes there's a little bit of a reverse logic that goes on in decision making uh, for whatever reason. The court took the easiest path to get there. It did so by granting summary judgment, and the easiest way to grant summary judgment was to hold that the critical issue was a question of law not a question of fact. If it's a question of law, then the judge, the state judge, is freer to make that decision. The standard is not as, as high to grant the motion, and so that's what was done in this case. And the, the decision or the holding by the state court judge that, that uh, experimental use was a question of law is contrary to what uh, the holdings are in, in uh, the federal courts, which is that it's a question of fact. 
Great. So let me uh, throw it, before we turn it over to everyone for questions, let me ask a few of my own. Um, so one thing I've seen as a patent scholar at the, at the Supreme Court lately is that some justices view patent law as an exceptional, ex, exception to the rule, right? There's some patent exceptionalism. Um, so my question here is, is that the case here? What, this case will definitely answer the question of when does a patent malpractice end up in federal court and when in state court? Is it only going to deal with that? Are there other areas of the law, immigration, the justices were interested in this today, is it going to be a much broader decision or is it going to be very narrow uh, on the patent issues? Depends on how they write it. I think that, that all of the above are teed up. The court might, uh, it is, uh, I, I think, squarely teed up between the arguments for petitioner and, uh, in particular, some of the amicus arguments in support of the respondent, whether or not the analysis of arising under jurisdiction is the same, does arising under mean the same thing in 1331 as in 1338? That is, do you use the same yardstick to decide whether a patent issue comes within arising under jurisdiction and any other federal question? That is teed up squarely. Um, they, I think the, the court could, could decide this uh, narrowly or broadly depending on how it, how it chooses to get after it. Um, the, the court has, arrest, has addressed arising under jurisdiction um, a fair amount over time. Uh, it has decided um, two significant cases in the context of patent issues and in neither did it treat patents as having a different yardstick under 1338 than it did than they did under 1331, uh, but that's squarely presented here. If the court does treat patents differently, it's not going to do so by saying a rising under means something different in 1338 versus 1331. What the court is going to say is both tests trigger Grable. Graber, Grable means substantiality. And one of the hallmarks of substantiality is, is this the type of issue that requires a special resort to a federal forum and expertise? And cases that are exclusively appealable to the federal circuit are probably the strongest case for substantiality. Because Congress not only conferred original exclusive jurisdiction to the federal trial course, but then it decided that to promote uniformity, there could only be, no matter where geographically the case came from, one precedent declaring court, even at the intermediate level. And so if we get to a different answer for patent cases, it will be through the application of Grable's substantiality factor, not because the court acknowledges that 1338 is different than 1331. So let me follow up that. So if that's what they do. If I may, yeah. I have <laughs> <laughs> so if, if that's what the court does, do we get an answer on the other cases? Do we, are we still guessing about immigration? Are we still guessing um, about antitrust? I mean, these, these were all brought up at argument today, but it, it seems like they could come to a decision that answers the question for patent law and it leaves at least some question about these other areas. If I may, that, that is the respondent's position. Um, when you apply a Grable analysis, as um, Mr. Ryan pointed out, it is very complicated. And it is potentially complicated at the uh, early stages of the case. Uh, where there's a lot of legal wrangling and maybe a lot of time and energy is spent. But if I may, the, those kinds of cases are in a noise level. There's a, somebody raises an immigration issue, so they say Grable, and because um, I, you know, it was, a, it was a wrongful seizure at the border, so I'm raising Grable. Um, and yes, those, the question there, how substantial is it, that may, not, that may be a very difficult question. Maybe 85% of them get uh, remanded after removal. Patent cases don't fall into that category. There is, in that noise level, there is a big, bright line with, with patent cases. They were singled out by Congress um, both in uh, the Patent Act many, many years ago in the creation of the Federal Circuit uh, in 1982 and also uh, in the, the recent uh, America Invents Act, where one of the uh, Supreme Court cases, uh, Holmes Group versus Bornado, was actually reversed, or I, what do they call it? That it was legislatively 
overruled uh, in the America Invents Act, giving original jurisdiction to the federal courts over compulsory counterclaims. And so the, the, in terms of the congre congressional attention to the importance of uh, having patent matters decided by federal uh, tribunals who have that competence and solic uh, solicitude um, is it's it's a matter where it it's front and it it stands way out from all the other cases. So uh, the the respondent's position has not been that we should be um, applying Grable to find every single case that raises a federal issue to uh, be shunted into federal course that court that is not our position our position is that patent malpractice cases because of the importance of patents to the economy because of the special attention on the uniformity accorded patents by congress they do belong in, and because of their complexity they do belong in federal court on the, the, the question of the, the scope of, a, of any decisions that may come out of this case, one of the kind of the what happens next uh, issue, this is a legal malpractice case arising out of a patent matter. But if, the, if this is decided on a, if this case is decided on a principle, if whatever rule it is that comes out of this case is turns on the principle that patents are magic. And, and, and that there's a, they, they warrant s such a broader scope and reach of the arising under um, jurisdiction. If that's so, that is uncabined. That is not limited in any way to legal malpractice claims, which are few in number, relatively speaking. It would, the same concept would apply to all manner of state law claims, breach of contract cl uh, claims, like a you know, suit on a licensing agreement. I sue you because you're not paying me my licensing fee uh, for using my invention, but I don't have to pay you because your patent's invalid. Okay, well then that one goes, that breach of contract case is now in, in federal court or uh, business. And, and that is the likely result now under the American Invents Act. Um, only if it's a, counter, a compulsory counterclaim, but not if it's a defensive matter. It would be a compulsory counterclaim. But, but not if you're doing it as a counterclaim, only if you're raising it as a defense to a breach of contract claim. Do you see why Justice Holmes was right? <laughs> <laughs> I would ha I'd be happy with the result, uh, with the Justice Holmes result. But, but the, the logical result is it would encompass a divorce case if one of the things that had to be decided is the value or validity of a patent that one of the, the husband or wife owned for the appropriate division of the marital estate. Divorce cases in federal court? Is that appropriate? What about a probate matter? If what you have to do is decide the validity or scope of a patent as part of division of a decedent's estate. If, if the rule turns on patents being magic, then patents are magic, whether or not that, that includes a divorce or a legal malpractice case or a breach of a licensing agreement. So, so those are the, that's the logical end of any rule that says patents are magic and they've got to be in federal court because the state courts just uh, don't have the, the uh, ability to handle these. Well, patents are magic. <laughs> <laughs> you can create something out of nothing. I think uh, just to try and try and focus on another concern that that might get us out of, you know, concern about divorce cases and and certain license cases being brought into federal court. One of one of the big issues for all lawyers who are going who are either practicing patent law or thinking about it is what standards of conduct do you have to abide by. Are they the standards of conduct that uh, come out of decisions in federal court? Or are they the standards of conduct that, let's just, as long as we're taking arguments to the lo logical extreme, is it the conduct of any one of 50 states in the United States that 50 years from now may have had tr different treatment of uh, similar malpractice issues. 
as to, for example, in this case, um, in the Minton case, uh, is it, is one of the factors, one of the 12 or 13 factors that the Federal Circuit has said should be considered in determining whether experimental use occurred or not, is one of those factors essential? So that if you do not have that factor present, then there is no experimental use, even though the other 11 or 12 factors may be present? That's the decision that was made by this state court. Now you're getting into a realm of forum shopping. And can you imagine if you're practicing in as conservative a manner as you can to dot all the I's and cross all the T's, you better now do research of the law in 50 states on the question of what sort of research, just for example, you should do of prior art in submitting it to the Patent and Trademark Office. Find amongst those 50 states the most uh, restrictive in terms of having the highest standard, and then you better abide by that, okay? And you better do that for every critical issue or critical matter that you're handling on behalf of uh, your client, okay? I want to add a little bit to that. Um, uh, uh, let's, let's make it by way of a hypothetical. Let's suppose that uh, one is a patent attorney. And as a patent attorney, by definition, you don't, you don't leave the, the federal system when you're dealing with patents. You uh, deal with the patent office. If you appeal from the patent office, ultimately it ends up at the federal circuit. It's only one court of appeals for you. You file a, or defend a patent infringement case. It goes into federal court their court of appeals that they uh, have to abide is the federal circuit. So let's suppose that uh, one is a patent attorney and you make a mistake and you're sued for malpractice. You made a mistake. Where would you rather take your chances? In a state court that doesn't have any idea about whether you made a mistake or not or the federal circuit who knows you made a mistake? So your odds, if you, made, so if you made a mistake, you're better off to take your chances with a roulette wheel. If you didn't make a mistake, you want the court that knows patent law to evaluate you and judge you on whether you made a mistake or not because you didn't make a mistake. And so what you get in terms of the, the federal benefit that you get by having patent malpractice cases decided by the federal circuit system or the, the federal system that creates and enforces the patents, you get better patent lawyers who are all marching to the same drummer. They are all uh, working according to the same set of rules nationwide, practicing in the same way. And if they make a mistake, they have to go to the same court that they deal with. If they don't make a mistake, they go to that court and they're exonerated. So it creates uniformity across the nationwide system of patent attorneys, which because we deal with the system, because we are creating the patents, it's through the efforts of patent attorneys that patents are created and we negotiate, if you want to call it negotiate, we prosecute the patents with the, uh, the, the patent applications with the patent office in order to get the appropriate scope of protection. And we do that according to a set of rules and guidelines, all enforced by the federal circuit. And so if we're going to have all of our rules and guidelines enforced by the Federal Circuit, it's logical that if we err in our conduct, that we should be going up through the same system. Okay, great. So um, before I turn it over to see if there are any questions out there, I'll ask the final question. And I know that um, counts are sometimes reticent to vote count, but I like to vote count. So I know that Professor Ryan will engage with me if, if nobody else will. And I'll um, write it down. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it seems like Scalia and Thomas are likely to sort of pull back from the Federal Circuit's reading of Grable. Right? I think that's, that's at least to some degree from um, the oral argument. Any other predictions on where any of the other stars lie in this um, constellation? I'm going to leave that to the academics. <laughs> The only hint I got. I could tell you how our taxi driver voted. <laughs> <laughs> he used to be a patent examiner. Though, it turned out. <laughs> that, that, that's a bad sign for the economy. 
I don't have much of a read because today's argument basically confirmed for me that none of them understand Grable either. Right? At one point in the argument, one of the justices, and I can't remember who it was, said, so are you saying we count up how many cases this type of, that allowing this case in federal court, that it would be disruptive? You're telling us it's a numbers game? It's exactly what it says in Grable that it is. There were several indications that the court wanted to pull back from Grable during the argument. But I'm not sure how to count votes because I think there was one concept floating around that's not going to make it through the opinion writing stage. And it's a big one. It has to do with substantiality. And we got a lot of mileage out of saying, you don't have to worry about this being substantial because if the state court decides it, it won't ever be binding in the federal system, on the federal courts or anywhere else. Well, that's always the case in a second branch case. That's always the case. You could say that in Smith v. Kansas City title. Well, it's not substantial because if a state court decides the constitutionality of the Federal Farm Loan Act, that will never bind any federal courts and therefore it doesn't create precedent. And so the focus on that, I understand Jane's point about the PTO proceedings, but I don't think that they have thought through what it means substantial, what that word means, and the prong they created in Grable for federalism. I think that either a few of them are really sure or most of them have no idea, and we may actually come out with a slightly modified test from Grable. Great. All right. So with that, I'll see if they're turned over to the audience, see if we have any questions. Looks like Sean has one for us. Sit down. Thank you. And, Jane, you did a great job at oral argument today. The rest of you did a great job sitting and listening to it. But I just want to bring out a couple of issues that I heard. I guess the core question I have is what would be your one- or two-sentence definition of substantiality that you'd like the court to endorse? So, Jane, one of the arguments you are making is that the Fed Circuit essentially is collapsing necessity and substantiality, and it's always going to be necessary within the case within the case to decide to some extent patent law issues, but that shouldn't be your definition of substantiality. And maybe, Ted, you'd use that definition, but I'll give you a chance, too. I mean, it sounded to me here and at court that both of you are asking for bright-line tests. It's either all the cases should be in state court or all of them should be in federal court. I'll let you correct me on that, but that seemed to be a little bit. But let me – wait, hold on. But so let me ask the question is what would be your definition of substantiality? And then maybe a little bit on why, too. But maybe I'll start with Jane and then go to Ted, because I don't think I've heard your full argument yet. And then go back. When gauging substantiality, a court – grable substantiality requires a court to look at way factors, including looking at the nature of the federal issue, the embedded federal issue. Is it a constitutional issue? Is it a statutory issue? Is it a non-statutory or common law issue? And as you go along the continuum, it becomes less substantial. That's not a – there's not a bright line in there, but that's a factor to consider. A constitutional issue would be more substantial than a common law issue. Is the federal issue disputed or uncertain? But mere novelty of the issue isn't going to be dispositive. And a corollary of that would be does it need resolving? Because that was the situation in grable. Grable involved interpretation of a tax statute that they needed resolved. The IRS needed to know in a precedential way decided by a court that would bind the IRS, here's how it goes so that we would have certainty from henceforward on conveyance of certain land titles. You know, it's not just that it was uncertain, but that it needed resolving. Another factor 
uh, would be what are the cons what would be the consequences of the judgment, and I think that would go to the hypothetical nature, um, and and in this case I think that weighs against substantiality on Mr. Minton's claims, and you can look if you just look at the uh, the er earlier uh, Mr. Shills referred to the. The consequence is the same in a legal malpractice case because Mr. Mitten is going to get the fruits of his patent, and that's really what patent law is all about. Well, ixnay. And if you look at the prayer of what he asked for, the relief he asked for in the legal malpractice case and that he could get in the legal malpractice case versus the relief he asked for and potentially could have gotten in the patent litigation against the NASDAQ. The legal malpractice case, he sued for monetary damages. Give me dollars. That's the consequence. The consequence of the patent litigation, he sued for a declaration that the NASDAQ was infringing on his patent, patent number 643, an injunction against future infringement, and monetary damages. And the consequence of enforcement infringement injunction, that would be a factor of substantiality. Another factor to look at would be potential impact on a federal agency. And here, the PTO would not be bound by the, by any judgment in the legal malpractice case in a way that, for example, in the Grable case, the, the IRS was bound. And in fact, in that case, the solicitor, the, the impact on the IRS was sufficiently real that the Solicitor General appeared on behalf of the IRS. The United States appeared and, and weighed in favor of the, uh, the IRS because this was an important issue that really was going to affect them, and so therefore they had an opinion. And there was no PTO. There was no government uh, in our case here today. And, um, and so that, that's another factor that, that a court would look at in, in uh, weighing substantiality. But, there isn't, and, and there's something to be said for Professor Ryan's construct of, well, these are fuzzy. And it's, a, and it's not an ideal way to determine jurisdiction, where what you're looking at is in the first instance. You know, at the beginning of a law, we're talking about original jurisdiction here, where you, you remove or you don't remove before you file your answer, for God's sakes. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's not a perfect uh, rule, but that's what... Grable told us. Another issue, uh, another factor to consider in substantiality, wait a minute, I lost my train of thought, and I'm really sorry about that. Anyway, <laughs> there's another one that's real, real important. It's my competitive edge. Yeah. My competitive edge. for me. But, uh, uh, but I think those are the, are the, the sorts of factors that, um, oh, is it a, uh, the, the Empire Health Choice case shortly after Grable distinguished a substantial, a nearly pure question of law versus a determination of a federal issue in a manner that it's fact-bound and situation-specific. That's another hallmark or factor to consider in deciding whether or not uh, substantiality exists. But it's a, admittedly, by any measure, that's a, a fuzzy uh, yardstick, but that's been our yardstick since the Warren G. Harding administration. So... Um, We, 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 uh, what we've asked the court to do is to apply the Grable construct to necessity, actually disputed, substantial federalism, to apply that, and if you properly apply that to Mr. Mitten's case in particular and legal malpractice cases in general, they can't ever get there. And so the, the application of the Grable yardstick is a bright line. They're all out. But we're not asking the court to ditch the Grable construct. Well, if I may, what, what they are asking is to not apply Grable to uh, patent malpractice cases. Because if you apply Grable to patent malpractice cases, it meets all of the factors, the substantiality, the, the, um, the, the need to resort to the federal circuit, or rather to the, um, to the federal system in order to get a good, proper, just result. In fact, if you take some some of the quotes out of the, the Grable opinion, and maybe this is just briefing anecdotally, but you just take out, you just add the word malpractice in front of the federal blank law issue, 
and Grable applies on the numbers. There's just, we're, we have a straightforward application of Grable uh, to uh, patent malpractice cases showing the substantiality of the federal issue. And as long as Grable is good law, it's our view that there may be a bright line, let's say a fairly bright line, in patent malpractice cases, particularly the present one, where all of the issues turned on federal law. All of the, the, the entire case turns on uh, issues of federal patent law. It's w not very close to that line. If there may be other cases, maybe immigration cases that are down in that noise level, and there may even be an occasional patent case where let's say somebody did, you know, got, he got drunk and he didn't go and file it on the day he was supposed to. And so he's being sued for malpractice for not getting to the post office and suing it. Maybe that doesn't raise a substantial federal issue even in a patent case. We don't know. But we have our case. Our case is all patent. And there are other cases too. Let's just say we'll put them in the intermediate ground because uh, the assumption has always been, in this case, at least from the petitioner's side, we're dealing with a dead patent. There's nothing we can do to resurrect this patent. So there's really no patent issue here because the patent's dead. This patent was declared uh, invalid in, in the underlying case, which is what caused the malpractice lawsuit. But that is not the fact pattern of all patent malpractice cases. There are just as many, and I did an informal survey, but it, they're just all over the map. But you very commonly have a patent malpractice case that arises, as was argued today, in a context where it was um, due to the malpractice, it was not, it was held uh, not infringed but valid. Well, that patent is still valid. He can enforce it against another infringer who has a similar, um, a similar product. If he sues the first malpractice lawyer in a state court, gets a ruling, uh, say the patent owner gets a ruling adverse to him. The, let's say the, pat, the, the judge that didn't know what he was doing gets an adverse ruling against him on some issue of prior art or something. Now he can't sue the next infringer. He still has a valid patent, but he can't sue the next infringer because of what the state court said that would be binding on him as a matter of collateral estoppel. And that hurts patents, hurts uniformity of patents. Great. So it looks like Mike Carroll has our next question. So. Thanks. Um, so actually, uh, Mr. Carr just touched on the issue. I, in, in a quick glance through the transcript, this issue of issue preclusion, thinking about the federal interest and the, the issue preclusion consequences of essentially having one jurisdiction deciding questions of law uh, where the source of law is the other. So it, it's going, you might have a question of law in relation to malpractice that the Federal Circuit would be deciding if it had exclusive jurisdiction. Otherwise, you'll have uh, potential questions of patent law the state courts will be deciding. And if either of those decisions have preclusive effect, that could be quite distorting. And, and the justices touch on this, and then the argument moved away. Um, but that does seem to be one of the, when people are sort of uh, asking, so what, it does seem that, it, you know, the justices are very worried about the development of the law and protecting the integrity of the development of patent law, but we're told repeatedly that, it, but for preclusion, I didn't see any other argument that the development of patent law would be uh, harmed by state court uh, decisions in malpractice cases. So I guess, can you spin out a little more about the, and think about, uh, imagine that it's a patentable subject matter question. So. The legal malpractice t uh, claim turns on a failure to consider or raise a patentable subject matter bar. And if a state court decided in a malpractice case that the invention was not patentable subject matter, would that not have preclusive effect on the inventor in, in future cases? Are you asking my 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 view on that is yes. If, if a state court decided that, yes, we believe it would. But I guess it's more I'm asking about the argument. And the justices seem not to necessarily accept that because it, it does seem if they did, 
that would have become a bigger focus of the attention? Or did, um, they miss, did, did they miss the point? I, I think um, we're, when we talk about changing the development of, uh, of patent law, I think we're maybe looking at two different concepts there. One is if a, the state Supreme Court in Texas or wherever decides, um, as it did, let's say in this case, in our state, experimental use in a malpractice case requires knowledge on the part of the uh, person assisting with the experimentation that is being uh, used experimentally. That's the rule in Texas. Well, that means that practitioners in Texas, we're all going to get an email that tells us that that's the rule in Texas, and we get that, you know, we, I mean, I mean everybody's got malpractice uh, insurance, they send out like CLEs and whatever, so you get an email, and it's going to tell you that new decision by the state Supreme Court of whoever that uh, patent attorneys have to do X. Well, that changes the standard of practice for Texas attorneys, for California attorneys. So maybe if you go, and, and it is, it, it's not in terms of the development of the law, the development of the law, of patent law, is done through patent attorneys. We file the cases. We make the arguments. Uh, not patent attorneys, not like we're special, but the attorneys that are practicing in that area of law. Ultimately, we make the decisions to present uh, issues to the court, to argue them. And the issues that uh, attorneys argue, just like with product liability, how safe does a product have to be, some of those decisions are driven by decisions in malpractice cases. And so it's not, it's naive to think that malpractice cases do not alter the behavior of uh, attorneys. It does, ultimately. And so when when you have different rules that are being applied to patent attorneys by different states, it, if you have the uniformity line here, it goes on this non-uniform non -uniform side. If you have that decision on what they should be doing here in federal court, it's always going to go up to the federal circuit. It's always going to be the same rule applied. So that in terms of how it affects the development of patent law. It also affects patents. It affects the, I uh, hope it, they can, you can be heard. Anyway, it affects the development of patents because if an inventor is bound by a collateral estoppel factual finding in a case uh, that, uh, that somehow affects his ability to get future patents or the scope of enforcement of the future patents, then the public's interest is being affected by how that patent is being enforced or not enforced. So it, so it does have a federal impact both, you could say, indirectly on um, changing attorney behavior, uh, that the behavior of attorneys or their conduct in patent cases and patent uh, prosecution, and it also has a direct impact on pending patents. And patents that have been, or patent applications, and also on patents that are already granted, how they will be enforced, depending on uh, how a related patent, such as one that was a parent or a continuation of another patent, how that patent has been enforced in another case, which would be a malpractice case. So I don't know, I hope that answered your question, but... Um, if I could just interject, I think in, in this particular case, Mr. Minton has a continuation application that's pending. For those who are not as familiar with patent law, continuation is a subsequent patent application that has the same invention disclosed in it. It gives the patent owner an opportunity to get definitions of what the invention is considered, they're, they're called claims, considered by the examiner. and to write those claims in a somewhat different way than the original claims in the issued patent were to get different scope, possibly to avoid prior art. In this particular case, and Ted can speak to this uh, better than I, and I have to disclaim any, any firsthand knowledge of that application so there's not any kind of admissions being made on behalf of Mr. Minton. But the examiner is very interested in what the state's determination was of this experimental use. Why? Because 
if the examiner reads the opinion of the state judge that says there was no experimental use, therefore this invention was on sale, it's prior art in the examination of this continuation application. Has that issue come up in the prosecution? Well, first of all, I can't actually talk about the prosecution because it's confidential. But as far as the effect on continuation applications goes, there are two factors that are, let's say, two issues that came up regarding collateral estoppel during argument today. And one is that decisions by state courts do not bind the patent office. That is true. The decisions by federal courts do not bind the patent office because under collateral estoppel because the patent office was not a party. You have to be a party in order for a decision in a court case to bind you. And that's been, that was pointed out, and that is correct. However, the patent applicant is bound by court decisions under ordinary principles of collateral estoppel. And so if the collateral estoppel effect of a state court judgment is applied to a patent applicant in a continuation application, based on a court decision that says something is or is not prior art or does or doesn't mean something or you do or don't own a piece of prior art or you are or are not a co-inventor or something like that, if a state court makes that judgment in a final judgment, that may be binding on the patent applicant, which would in turn be applied in due course by the, according to the, would in due course be applied by the examiner to limit the scope of the patent rights that could be gained by the applicant. That would not be the case if that decision was made in a federal court. And so we don't, we don't, so when the state court makes a decision that could be binding on the applicant, it does affect how patent rights are ultimately going to be delivered by the patent office. I would just note that while Mr. Minton is bound by any final judgment of the state court in the legal malpractice case, he was already fully, finally, irrevocably bound by the final judgment in the underlying patent case that was in federal court. So the issue of issue preclusion was done and dusted before any lawsuit was ever even filed in state court on the legal malpractice claims. Mr. Minton was already bound by the judgment that happened in the underlying case. So the, any adverse judgment in the subsequent legal malpractice case then changed that landscape of job. That is true as to his original patent, not true as to continuation applications and other related patents that may already have been issued. There are another, there aren't any other issued patents at this point, but there are, often are. In fact, in air measurements, air measurements that was the case that, let's say, started this brouhaha, that was a continuation patent. That's very common. Great. So with that, I think I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking our panelists and Mr. Minton and Mr. Hoffman for their excellent arguments. Thank you.